Good morning, church family and ministry friends. This is Pastor Stephen Brooks. Welcome today to our online internet around the world church service. And I'm so glad that you are here today. And I tell you what, we're going to have a good time in God's word today. First, let's honor God by receiving the tithes and offerings and bringing those in to the storehouse of God. I'd like to read to you from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, and verse 17. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Praise the Lord. My friends, today, in our American culture, and I think it's kind of popular around the world, it's cool to wear a cross. You could uh, be a person that serves God in no way, but if maybe you want to feel good or maybe have people think maybe you're spiritual, you just put on a cross. <laughs> so you can live like a rat, but you can put the cross on and maybe try to soothe your conscience. And of course, that's just external piety. It has no meaning to it. The reality is, is that the force of the cross is trying to be stripped out of every aspect of our culture. And the reality of the cross is something that is trying to be taken away from whether it's public schools or taken away from society in general. It's, uh, it's an effort to be removed that is being done against the cross, against the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross. Because if you want to receive forgiveness of sins, Forgiveness was accomplished and paid for at Calvary on that cross. And if you need healing in your body, the truth is that the price for healing was paid for where? At Calvary. And also the price for re uh, everything in redemption is made available to us through the atoning work that Jesus of Nazareth did when he hung on that cross there at Calvary. And that would include provision so that we are delivered from the curse of the law and all of the yucky stuff in it, which included poverty. Praise God. So we thank God for the cross. And because of this, every year on Resurrection Sunday morning, we celebrate what God did. Now, Resurrection Sunday is only a few weeks away. It's March the 31st kind of comes early this year, doesn't it? March 31st is Resurrection Sunday. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring in our very best offering and we're going to sow our best seed on March 31st. Now, if you can get it in a little bit before, that's fine. But I don't want you to rush. I want you to take your time and prepare your special Resurrection offering. Praise God. One of my jobs as a minister, of course, is to develop your faith. And I have noticed that in Scripture and also throughout church history, that when we have opportunities to sow special offerings, then it gives us the ability to release our faith, maybe stretch it, but also to release it and therefore break into new levels. They are God's divine opportunities for our lifting up. So what we want to do on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, is we want to honor God, and we want to thank Him for the great and unspeakable gift that He gave to the world through His Son, Jesus. And we're going to honor God by bringing our best gift on that day. Praise the Lord. We're going to honor Him through the resurrection seed. So this is one special day out of the year 2024 when we commemorate how God gave His very best, and we commemorate it by giving our very best seed offering. Mm -mm. Thank you, Jesus. Now, 
I want to encourage you to break through with your faith, and I want to encourage you to even stretch your faith. And if it catches your attention, then usually it'll catch God's attention. You know, there's, there's offerings, if we're honest, and I know that, we're, that we are, there's offerings that we can give very, very easy. Uh, they're not even missed. We can comfortably give it. And that's, that, there's, there's a place for, you know, the, the regular offering. But my friends, a resurrection seed, when God gave his offering, his son, I tell you what, this son laid his life down. Woo, God felt that. Why? He only had one son. <laughs> so there's something about giving an offering that stretches your faith that really moves you. And when it does, I believe those are the kind that move God. Praise the Lord. Now, we could say that any and every offering, in a sense, uh, touches God's heart, and it does. But there is something, though, about a sacrificial seed offering where God takes special note of that, and it has the ability to move you into special miracles. So I want you, as you give and prepare your resurrection seed, to sow it towards the miracle that you are believing God to do in your life. Woo, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so with an expectation, so with joy. And you might think, well, Pastor Steve and I did this last year. Yes, and you know what? My wife and I did too. But here's the thing. We don't just go to the gym one day a year. Yes, we may have a, a special moment like what we're doing on uh, Resurrection Easter Sunday, but I'm not going to say, well, I did that also back in 1982, and therefore, you know, no, my friends, I want my faith to grow, and I want to break through into new levels. And I see this as God's divinely appointed seasons and opportunities for your lifting. Now, God doesn't need to be lifted. He's already the Most High God. So these are opportunities for our breaking forth. And pray carefully about what you're going to do. Don't just do something real quick. Well, here's a response, Pastor Stephen. No, let your response be on the frequency of what God wants you to do. Husbands and wives pray together and, you know, have a little time with the Holy Spirit and get that number that stretches your faith, but also which honors God, of course, and there's no pressure. Just do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. After all, you can't give a billion dollars, can you, if you don't have it? <laughs> so you can only give what you have. There's no pressure. But I would say that sometimes God wants us to be creative in our giving. Maybe God wants us to reach into something. And because why? God would call for it. And if he does that, that's between you and the Lord. All you have to do is do what he instructs you to do. Praise God. Mm -mm. Heavenly Father, I pray for your people that as they're bringing the tithe in, because the tithe belongs to you, 10% of the income goes to you, and it causes the ministry to run smoothly. Father, I pray that as they're bringing the tithe in, and as they are praying and preparing their resurrection seed offering, I pray that you give them seed to sow. I know, Father, that... March 31st is only a few weeks out. It's, it's about exactly three weeks away. It's literally um, just actually a little under uh, three weeks away. And I'm praying, Father, that you give them seed to sow. And they may have a number. And they may not quite be there yet as far as, as actually having that. But if there's something that they're wanting to maybe sell that they don't even use, but they want to use it for your kingdom, then, Father, help them with this creative giving. Thank you, Father God. We give you praise. Father, we thank you also that the reality is, is that when it comes to special projects and great kingdom expansion, that area really moves forward in the area of of special giving, special offerings. So, Father, I thank you for showing your people what to do, and I thank you that you're going to help them reach that number, and I pray for many that it would be the largest seed they have ever sown, because they want to break into new levels. Thank you, Father God. And, Father, I thank you that you see also that my wife and I, we don't just 
preach and teach and uh, talk about what's to be done. We actually are givers as well. And Father, you know that. But I pray that your people catch the spirit of what you're doing. We thank you, Father God. We give you all of the glory and praise. And we thank you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Woo, praise God. I, I tell you what, I'm very, very excited. Amen. You know I'm not going to run off and build a casino, right? <laughs> Woo, we're going to use the special offerings that you're sowing to strategically in a very planned and orchestrated way, spirit led, move the ministry forward through the uh, doors that are open that God has given the green check mark on. Praise God. We're after, we're after souls and we are after building up God's people, training and equipping them all over the world. Thank you for your giving. Praise God. Now, for those of you that prefer to mail in your giving, you like a physical address, send your tithe and your special offering to Stephen Brooks International, P.O. Box 717, Moravian Falls, North Carolina. Our zip code is 28654. If you want to bring your tithe and your special offering in online, you can do so anywhere in the world as long as you can get on the internet. Praise God. Go to stephenbrooks.org. Look at the top. There's a header that says, Give online. You can click that little drop down menu comes down, says tithes and offerings, and you can click that. It'll take you to the giving page, and you can bring the tithe in, and you can bring in your resurrection offering. Mm -mm. Glory, glory, glory to God. When you do, make a little note and just say this is uh, the part. The part that's. Uh, for the resurrection offering, just make a note. This is for the resurrection offering. If you're mailing in a check or something, just write, you know, that notation. This is for the resurrection offering. And we will make sure that it is appropriated for that. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Your giving is touching lives all over the world. One day there will be an, an accounting and we will be able to see uh, what all uh, was done to lift people when people were about to throw in the towel or about to give up and a message reached them, but it reached them because somebody paid for the TV cameras. It reached them because even on YouTube, somebody's paying for the, you know, somebody paid for the lighting kit and somebody paid for the camera and uh, every from the pulpit to everything else to the roof over it. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so the kingdom of God marches forward and to thank you for your giving. Thank you for being a part of what God has called us to do. And you will share in the rewards. And that really does make me happy. I really do want to see fruit credited to your account. And one day when we get to heaven, we will see the wonderful things together that were done and we'll rejoice together. All right. Thank you for your giving. Praise God. I'll be praying over your resurrection offerings as they come in. Don't rush. Take your time, but get it in either on or before March 31st. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right. Now let's talk about some things that can be very, very helpful in the days in which we are living. I want to talk about fixing your eyes on Jesus and we're going to begin today in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. And I would like for us to start in verse 1. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we are jumping into your word, we ask that you would cause light to break forth. Light representing understanding where the spiritual illumination takes place by the work of your Holy Spirit so that we can see it and apply it to our lives. We thank you, Father, for all of the answers and solutions in your word, and we thank you that they're breaking forth today as we are now studying it. In Jesus' name we pray. We give you all of the glory, and we say amen. Woo! Now, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So my friends, life uh, in Christ is more like a marathon. It's not like the 100 meter dash. Of course, the 100 meter dash is usually the most watched event 
in the Olympics because it's over in less than 10 seconds. <laughs> it's very exciting, very, very explosive. But, you know, the marathon takes a lot of endurance and you've got to, you got to learn to hang in there and be tough and push through. Praise God. Now it says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. I want to talk about that today. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Praise God. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That would be a position of authority. Now, I've noticed over the years that the reason that many Christians do not make good progress or do not accomplish various assignments that God has given to them is primarily because of one thing. And I would attribute that to broken focus. Very, very interesting. And so what we have to do in our lives in order to fix our eyes on Jesus is we have to deal with these areas of broken focus. And we have to take a, you know, like a short examination. It doesn't take long. You could probably do it in 30 seconds. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, just identify distractions. And usually immediately those identifications can begin to take place. And then we can uh, deal with that. How should we deal with them? Well, we should disconnect from what would be distracting us. Why? Because these are non-productive pursuits that we very easily can slip into, uh, take a detour into, maybe just to explore. And maybe you end up really, really liking it. I've had many ministers over the years, you know, invite me to play golf. But um, I don't play golf. And somebody said, how come you don't play golf? And my answer is that because I'll probably like it. And I, that's, that's what I don't need. I, I am so busy with what, had, what God has called me to do. And I'm, I'm very happy with my life, the full spectrum of my life, with my, my marriage, my family, and the full platter of work in the ministry that the last thing I want is to maybe kind of start playing around with something and think, you know, I like this. I, I think I'm going to like uh, work this in. <laughs> well, there's really not room to work it in. So the only way I could get it in is to begin to diminish uh, something else, which would mean take it, taking my focus off of somewhere where it's greatly needed. Here's, here's my justification for my life. When I get to heaven, I'll have all the time to play all the golf that I want. And I'm not saying anything negative about ministers who do play golf. Maybe, maybe they can fit it in. And that's cool. And maybe that's an outlet where they find stress and peace. And maybe that's even a place where they find, um, you know, some fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Usually more in the walking on the beautiful greens, not so much trying to hit a little tiny ball into a hole 400 yards away. That, I've been told, can be very aggravating. Mm -mm. <laughs> it takes years to get good at it. But, my friends, what we want to do is we want to phase out non productive pursuits. And if it doesn't really, in a sense, line up with the path that God has you on, why would you let it uh, snag your attention? Because it's going to pull you away from it. Let's talk about these things today. We need to, at times, readjust our focus. Maybe you already do have a focus, but it's not, it's not like 2020 vision. We need to get it more accurate. Praise the Lord. And I'm sure you've seen this over the years as well as you kind of journey through uh, life. Uh, you've noticed that those who don't master focusing on a single primary issue, they end up becoming what here in America we call a jack of all trades, but yet a master of none. So they're kind of like kind of good at a lot of different things, but they've never excelled in a singular thing. Therefore, they still 
uh, it's almost like they're, they can't break out of mediocrity. And if they do, it's only by a little bit. Mm, they can't get that separation that they're looking to go to the next level. And again, it would come back to areas of broken focus. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Mm -mm. Let me give you an uh, interesting example that it had me thinking about this over the last few days. And of course, I've seen many examples. I know you would too in life, but here's one that just happened. I was at the post office the other day and, uh, and you know, the post office is real close by. It's not even a hundred yards from here. And so I was at the post office and I just zipped over there, uh, before I came to the, uh, ministry center here. And while I was, uh, getting my mail, uh, there was a gentleman, he's probably in his early forties. And he said, Hey, is that your truck out there? I said, yes. And he, he was saying, wow, that's a really nice truck. And he was asking me questions about my truck. And that's one of the reasons I got that vehicle because it's like a, it's like a guy magnet. It, it's a conversation starter and it allows me to without, you know, like taking a Bible and saying, Hey, do you want to know about Jesus? <laughs> it, al it allows me to have usually them bring up the conversation. And then as we kind of, kind of casually start, you know, talking about a vehicle or something about that, you know, rims, tires, lift kits and stuff like that, then I can, you know, begin to just bring it around, you know, about Jesus. Hey, do you go to church? Do you, do you know, uh, do, do you read the Bible or stuff like that? And so it's a conversation starter, and that's one of the reasons God's blessed me with it. But as I was talking with this uh, nice man, uh, as we got towards the end of the conversation, uh, he gave me his business card. And his business card was not the little bitty card. It was, it was more like the size of a postcard, and it could even be used as a postcard mailer. And he gave me that, and I looked at it, and he has a martial arts studio, and he's a, you know, a master martial artist. And, you know, because I've, I've spent years uh, in martial arts, I spent like 14 years really uh, involved in all the martial arts in uh, one particular. And, you know, you kind of get a sense when you're around it a lot of who's, who can actually do it. And I kind of felt like this is not his thing. I mean, when he showed me the card, uh, it's just, it just, and he didn't, he didn't really have that appearance of like somebody that, uh, uh would be like a high ranking martial art, black belt type guy. Y usually when you come across people like that, they're very confident and they're, they're real sharp, you know, and they, they, especially if you're running it as a business, you have to have that together. And I wasn't quite picking that up from, uh, this friend that I just met. And, uh, but I thanked him for the card and, uh, he said, I thought you might like it. I said, well, thanks. You know, I appreciate that. And so I got my truck headed over to the office. When I got in the truck, I flipped the card over and on the back side of the card, it said, um, pressure washing business. Uh, does your home need to be pressure washed? Is it dirty? We also offer pressure washing services. And so I thought, uh, and I could tell, I could tell he's, he's kind of struggling, but I could tell by the card what's going on. What would that be? Broken focus. You know, it'd be kind of like, think of it. It'd be kind of like you or I. Let's say we need to change the tires on our vehicle. So we take our vehicles down to the tire dealership and we go together and we say, hey, let's change our tires. Just go and talk about Jesus. Go, go change our tires. We pull up. Go inside, talk to the person at the counter. Hey, we need to change our tires. Great, great. We've got a special. Buy four, uh, uh, excuse me, buy three, get one free. Oh, good, good, good. We'll do it. Here's the size, stuff like that. And what if the guy at the counter said, you know what, while you're waiting and the guys are going to, you know, work on your tires and put the new tires on, while you're waiting, we do have another service we offer. Oh, what's that? Uh, we also do laser eye surgery. What? Oh, yes. Well, right here at the back side of the garage, we have a little cape, a blind, and we pull it over. And, you, you know, we notice that you, you have glasses. So if you want us to fix your eyes while we're rotating and fixing your tires, we can do the laser eye surgery for you over here at the same time. Uh, I, I don't know if I want to go for that. I, I, I came here to get my tires changed. I, I didn't know you did. I, yeah, we do eye surgery, too, right over here. Well, how, how do you do that? Well... 
we have a laser that we use after we put your new tires on. We use the laser to align and balance the tires. We figured out we could use that same laser to, uh, you know, like point it at your eyes and fix your eyes and around your eyes perfectly. Oh, no, thanks. I don't think I want to do that. So what's, what's going on? Why would that never work? It's, it's a major broken focus. Look, when I go to the dentist to have my teeth clean, I don't expect them to like start some kind of a foot examination on my foot. Well, since you're laying here and we're working on your teeth and your feet are propped up, why don't you take those shoes off? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna check, your, check your feet. And uh, we do have one of the ladies over here that does tooth cleaning, and she also can do give you a pedicure. <laughs> uh, no, no. <laughs> Are you saying you don't trust us? Uh, yeah, I, I don't trust you at all. Amen. I think I want to leave. Praise God. See, broken focus. You start doing all these things and you're trying to do all this stuff. It's never it's never going to work for you. Well, I, I pastor even have a lot of interest. That could be a problem. And you need, to, you need to dial that down and work with the Holy Spirit and just totally like cold turkey drop things that are literally distracting you and you're playing with the minor when you need to be working and focusing on the major. Mm -mm. Praise the Lord. Again, Hebrews chapter 12, verse two, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So how do you look unto Jesus when he's not here physically? How do you look unto him? And uh, how does this work? Let's talk about it today so we can heal this area of broken focus because your destiny and your assignment is way too important for you to be tinkering around and playing with something when you're supposed to be on task. Mm -mm. And even, even if you know what your assignment is and you're not able to fully jump into it yet, you still need to keep building towards it. Look, I wasn't born behind a pulpit. I wasn't born holding a Bible saying, thus saith the Lord. No, I realized when I was younger that there was a calling for ministry, but I didn't just sit around, wait for that to happen. I developed that and I studied and studied and studied because the Bible says study to show yourself approved the workman who does not need to be ashamed. But while I was doing all of that study and I was working a full-time job and I was uh, with a salaried position, 48 hours a week, and I would work that job. And, you know, eventually after doing that for years and years and years and years, the calling transitioned into a full-time calling. When one day God told me when I was going into work, he said, turn in your two week notice. You're going full-time into the ministry. So full-time ministry is a divine calling and you never want to go into it until God sets you into that office because when he calls you and when he sets you into it, that means he's now responsible for uh, the well-being of your ministry. In other words, he gives supernatural equipment. He also brings supernatural supplies. Uh, if you go on your own, uh, even if you have a good intentions, you're going to run into a lot of heartache. Only go when he sends you. Praise God. But my friends, uh, you have to look the long view. Remember, this is an endurance race we're in, not a sprint. So even if you can't go all hands on to that full thing that you know God has for you, you can still develop it on your side. And oftentimes God even allows that to see who is really hungry and who's really desperate to break through. You know, when, when my wife and I were in ministry school training, it was very, very difficult. I'm not talking about the lessons that, that was all, you know, all of that. I actually already knew I'd already learned all of that, but the real uh, ministry training was brutal. I mean, there's, I can't think of any other word for it. It was absolutely brutal. Why? Because you had a whole bunch of jealous elders you had a bunch of uh, 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 people wanting to be in ministry that didn't understand really what ministry was. They thought it just was grabbing a microphone and screaming. <laughs> and out of the, at one point, close to 300 people in the ministry training class that went, it went for about two years. Out of the, about the 300 people, I think today, I think today there's probably less than five 
that actually are still in it. It actually made it and are still doing it. It's, it's probably maybe four, four of us. <laughs> That's why it was brutal. And God allowed it. God allowed it because uh, it, it develops you. It, it's tough. And when it's tough and you're, you're still hanging in there and you're still pressing through and you have to pray to uh, really kind of deal with all the stuff that you see, and sometimes have to endure that many unjust things. Woo! I tell you what, it'll it'll cause you to really um, put some roots down. It's not just the same. L listen, it's not just for ministers. If you go in the business, you will pay your dues. There is no free ride to the top, and ain't nobody going to give you one. There's fierce competition. It doesn't matter what field you go in, whether it's medical, whether it's sales, whether it's uh, anything, there is competition out there. And the, the more you want to rise, the, 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 the sharper the other competition is. Now in ministry, there's not competition, but in ministry, there is uh, opposition that you, that's unique to ministry and that the enemy does not want you to prevail. Why? You're, you're, you're literally trying to pull souls out of his kingdom. And those that are pulled out, you're trying to now equip them so they, be, they can be victorious. So you have some different things that you run up against in ministry that are unique to that calling. Praise God. But whatever it is, you can begin to focus and then as you move forward, then you could put more on it, more attention to it. And then eventually you get, you get over into that place. Now, let's say you saved and saved and saved. Now you can finally start your business full time. Good. Go for it with unbroken focus. Praise God. Now we are going back to the book of Joshua uh, chapter one. And I want to ask you to meet me in verse seven. Let me grab a drink real quick of some hot tea here. Joshua 1, verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe. So there is the need, my friends, for observation or to focus on what God said, His principles, His way of doing things. Um, oh, it's, it's interesting when I, over the years, I've heard people stand up in church and give testimonies. I'm saved, and I love Jesus with all my heart. And people say, Amen, and tears run down the cheeks. And that's, that's sweet. That, that, that is, and it is sweet. Thank God. Glad you made it. Glad you made it in. You're on your way to heaven. But you know what? If you're saved and you love Jesus, you're going to have to realize that's not enough to get you through in victory. Now, if you want to just like somehow to like, you know, grovel through and while the devil pummels you and one day you'll, you realize, Oh, I finally made it. I got beat up real bad by the en enemy, but I finally made it to heaven. I died. Now I'm in heaven. But if you want, if you want to make it, you're going to have to get full of the word of God. You're going to have to get yourself so full and saturated with the word of God that the devil cannot push you around anymore. And he can't even push you around in your sleep. Mm -mm. Not only when you're awake, but when you're in a, you're in your sleep, even in your dreams, you talk back to the devil. <laughs> even in your dreams, you would tell a temptation. No, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. Mm -mm. Praise God. But that takes observation. So he said, observe to do a call according to all uh, the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Wow, that honestly takes a lot of focus. You really have to focus to fulfill your calling. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left. Don't turn. In other words, don't be distracted because there's plenty of things out there. that are going to want you to take a left hand turn and a right hand turn. They're going to want to get you off the freeway of the fast track towards your destiny and get you off on these. What uh, down in the South, we call them rabbit trails. It actually looks like a trail, but it's a trail to nowhere. It's just something the rabbit made. There's no need to even pursue it. It's not even a real path. Okay, so do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper, that you may prosper wherever you go. So we see that focus is therefore a key ingredient 
in your overall success and prosperity. And we also see that you can prosper wherever you go. Uh, so often, the reason a person is not succeeding is not because the location is not good. Now, there could be some places where, uh, yes, that part of the town is dead. That, For example, maybe all of the action used to be on Main Street, but uh, Main Street is all dried up. You've got a bunch of little mom-pop shops. It's never going to be busy. The money's not there anymore. It's over on where the new freeway they put in, and that's where all the traffic is at, and that's where all the new development is at. So things like that you would need to uh, keep in consideration. But often location is not the problem. It's uh, a matter of a person uh, not focused. So you have to realign your focus because it says that you may prosper wherever you go. Now you want to go to the right spot, but you want to get and you want to get that right. But again, it's back to the area of focus. If you don't stay focused on your assignment, you won't get uh, or you won't end up being in the wrong location. And we see a great example of this in the life of King David, Second Samuel chapter eleven. He's had some really good success. But now he wants to sit back and kind of take it easy for a little bit. And there is a place for a vacation. I can understand that, but not when you're supposed to be working. Praise the Lord. Some people, they want to go on endless vacations. Some people want to end, they, they want to live on an endless cruise. Why? Either they don't know their assignment or they have gotten so distracted and now sucked into this thing of the world system that they've lost that fire. And it's a very dangerous place to be. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle. In other words, this is when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Classic example. Wrong place, wrong time. Verse 2, then it happened. And as we know, uh, the rest of the story became very, very well known. Matter of fact, I was reading of a minister who went to the beach to get a little salt water refreshing and kind of get away from the crowds. And he said while he was on the beach, he heard a noise and he looked up and it was an airplane pulling a banner. And the banner was an advertisement. And it said, David and Bathsheba. And it was an advertisement for a local theatrical play reenacting the story of David and Bathsheba. Can you imagine that if somebody went to David while he's not off at war, he's just sitting back at his palace bored. Can you imagine if somebody would have gone to him and would have said, David, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. You've lost your focus. And if you don't re-correct it and get into what you're supposed to be doing, you're going to make a blunder that's so big that even 2,800 years from now, they're still going to be talking about it. It'll be world famous. David would have probably said, oh, Oh, you got the wrong guy. Look, I know that we got a lot going on here, and I'm the king and stuff like that. But look, we're, we're just in this one region of the world, and uh, we're, we're, you know, we want God's name to be glorious. But nothing like that's going to happen to me. And it happened, and it happened real quick. Wow, 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 wow. Mm -mm. He lost his focus. He lost his passion. If you're out of position, you are highly vulnerable to attack. And the enemy, this is wild. I've seen it. I've seen it with my own eyeballs. The enemy can play non-spiritual people the same way a virtuoso plays the violin. Uh, somebody who's mastered the violin can pick up a violin and just play. Their off day is better than, than like somebody that's really good their best day. They're, they've mastered violin. They can just grab and play it. Listen, the devil can take non-spiritual people, even Christians that aren't walking in the spirit. The devil can, if he needs to use somebody, it's like he can just grab them and play them like a violin. It, it's like around here, bluegrass is real popular. And there are some world-class bluegrass players. They can grab a banjo and 
play it like it's on fire. That's the way the devil can grab some people. He's like, I need somebody to tempt that person. And he just grabs somebody and just stirs them up. And the next thing you know it, they're over here doing something to try to snare uh, uh, what would be a great prize for the devil. And he has no interest in those he's using uh, except for the sake of just playing them like a like an old wore out banjo. That's a, you know that they're just that they're not even what he's after. He just wants to use them because he's after a big target. Mm -mm. I'll say it again. It is one hundred percent the truth. The enemy can play non spiritual people the same way a virtuoso plays a violin. He can grab them and use them. Woo! Um, and the thing that's interesting is they don't even conceive. They don't even know they're being used by the devil. They don't even know that they're like a card that's being played by the enemy. <laughs> Woo! My goodness. Look, um, I've been to the area of Jerusalem that's called the city of David. And I, those of you that have gone on tour with me, you've stood there. And you know that the city of David is uh, one of the hottest archaeological places in Israel now. And it's on the side of a hill. It's like a cliff. And that's where David's palace was. And then there's the ravine. And then there's a hill with the cliff over on the other side. And so it's, it's a piece of cake. You could stand there and realize I'm standing right in that location of where David's palace was. And wow, I have a really good view. And you could see rooftops and stuff like that of what would have been other houses and other uh, homes that would have been in the area. So let me say this about, uh, about Bathsheba. Uh, I'm sure she loved God. And I'm sure she was a very nice woman. And the Bible Look, the, God's Word does not waste any words. The Bible says that she was a beautiful woman. But let me tell you right now, any woman taking a bath out in an area where she knows a man could see her, uh, you, you're not talking very spiritually deep right here. Oh, Pastor Stephen, she loved God. Uh, yeah, she, uh, there's a lot of people that love God that don't have a clue of holiness in any bone of their body. They love the Lord, and they maybe even in a sense follow after commandments where they don't really go out and do awful bad stuff. But they're, no, 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 there's no spiritual death. You, you can't tell me that a woman taking a bath, uh, you know, uh, where somebody could see her and that doesn't bother her. Uh, you can't tell me that's a holy person. No, a covenant person. Okay, sure. Somebody that loves God. Yeah. But somebody that's uh, spiritually deep, not a chance in your life. Mm -mm. And David, David saw her taking, I mean, totally naked, taking a bath. And the next thing you know, he's inflamed with lust. And, uh, oh, but Pastor Stephen, she's married. Uh, it, when the devil already is working, and he's got that grip, and he's got that flow going, and, oh, oh, I get a chance to meet the king, oh, and all of this stuff. And um, uh, he can play them like cards. He can play people like that like cards all day long. You know he can do it to the sinners. Because it, we are told by the, uh, the Apostle Paul in the epistles that the world is under the dominion of darkness. And it, it is ruled by the prince of the power of the air, Satan himself. Now, when you are brought into the kingdom of light, you are now exempted out of that kingdom as long as you know your authority. And if you walk in your authority, he can't play that stuff on you. And it's like it says in the book of Proverbs, the snares are laid in full view of the bird. And no bird's dumb enough to go down there and land in that snare when he knows his life is over if he does it. But look, you either are going to walk in the spirit or you're going to step in it. You're going to walk in it. You're going to, you're going to step into that snare or you're going to step in some stinky doo-doo. It's like going out on a cow pasture. And you, you know, if you don't watch where you're walking, you're going to step in a cow patty. Maybe that was just put there a few hours earlier. And you're going to have a big mess to clean up. So walk in the spirit or you're, or you're walk into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stay focused. Woo. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 4, verse 10. I'm so glad that you're here today hungry for God. Woo. Hungry for God's word. Want to keep your focus on Jesus. 
Mm, keeping your focus on Jesus. You know, when you keep your focus on Jesus, in so many ways, you're also keeping your focus on his word, what he said, observing carefully what he said. The older you get and the stronger you get in your walk with God, every day does get sweeter and you begin to realize more and more God meant what he said and he said what he meant. And you better read the fine print. And you better do exactly what he said. Dig into it, devour it. Get saturated with it. Amen. And your days of broken focus will begin to dissipate within 24 hours. Praise God. Second Timothy chapter four, verse 10. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for where? For Jerusalem that he might go to the holy city of God and pray. Paul, I feel like, I feel like I'm really called to deep, deeper levels of prayer. And I want to, I want to go to Jerusalem and pray. No, you don't. You liar. You excuse maker. You want out of here because you don't want to serve God anymore. Do you? That's the truth. Demas walked out on a relationship and a ministry connection with the most anointed man on the planet, the Apostle Paul himself. Can you imagine just the privilege of having access to be able to work with this man, with the anointing on this man's life that wrote two thirds of the New Testament? Uh, I'd like to be around that. Gets, I'd like to hear that teaching firsthand. I would like even for some of that anointing to kind of rub over here. And he abandoned Paul. Now, I can understand that Paul's in chains and he's getting really close to facing martyrdom. And maybe that really began to kind of cook within demons. He's like, Oh, I'm around the hot potato and they're going to, if he goes down and he's going down there, they're, maybe they're going to come after me too and throw me into a dungeon, cut my head off. Also, uh, I'm out. I'm out. Where does he go? He goes to Thessalonica. Oh, Pastor Stephen, that's probably where he grew up at. That was probably home. Uh, no, no, no. That's where if you wanted to get drunk and really sin, that's where every sailor knew, hey, you want a wild time? You want to go to a city of sin? Go to Thessalonica. That's your place. That's Sin City. And that's where he went. I've been holding myself back and straining myself for all of this. I've had it. I'm going to cut loose. Well, my friends, what happened? Major broken focus, major broken focus on Jesus, got his eyes off Jesus. And it says, he has forsaken me, having loved this present world. I'm so glad that, of course, there's nobody listening to me who's facing that challenge. But my friends, if you start flirting around with the world, it'll start to call you like a siren's call with the sweet Melodic temptation, come over here and see what we have to offer you. But you know what? There's no life in it. There's no life in it. And those that have sold their souls for it will suffer the eternal consequences for it. Mm -mm. Stay sharp. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your prayer life strong. Spend time in the Word. Amen. Hang out with those who love God. Glory to God. And you know what? Demas took off and left. Broken focus to the point where boom, he walked out on God and walked out on God's great apostle. My goodness. Praise the Lord. He was embarrassed of Paul's chains and Paul's impending martyrdom. My goodness. Lord Jesus, I thank you that nobody under the sound of my voice will ever have a sad testimony like Demas. I thank you that everybody watching me and hearing me right now will make it faithfully all the way to the end with unbroken focus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's talk about a few points about how you can keep your focus and do everything that God has called you to do. Number one, I would say, stop watching what everyone else is doing. Even if there's tremendous exposure, okay, maybe you hear about it, you see it or something like that, but stop being uh, like infatuated and captured 
with what everybody else is doing when you're supposed to be doing your own thing. Now, exposure is good concerning perhaps what's going on in your field. <clears throat> Maybe new technology or new breakthroughs that you need to be aware of. Excuse me just a moment. So while exposure is good, that doesn't give you some kind of a license to go out and start being a copycat, doing this, doing that, trying to uh, just replicate it the way they're doing it. No, you have your own way of, uh, of creating and walking out what God has called you to do. You know, in my own personal life, there's, you know, I'm aware of thousands of ministers and I know hundreds of ministers. And that, that's all wonderful and nice. But really, in my life, when it comes down to it, there's only three preachers I actually listen to. There's only three preachers that on a regular basis, not every day because I'm so busy, you know, creating my own messages and things like that, that I can't do it all the time. But I would say consistently, uh, out, of, out of the over a million preachers on the planet, there's only three that I actually listen to on a consistent basis. They're older than I, I than I am, and they're seasoned in the things of God. And what they say, whenever I listen to them, speaks faith building, life edifying, strength of Jesus on the inside of me. And I pray that my messages, of course, do to you as well. And I would trust that they are, which is why you're sticking around. Praise God. But what you have to do is you have to Stop watching what everyone else is doing. I have, I have the few that inspire me and bless me. But uh, I, I can't like be watching all this stuff that people says, hey, did you hear what so-and-so said on YouTube? I said, no, I, I've, I, I'm so busy doing what God called me to do. I, have, I don't have time to jump over here and jump over there and jump all over the place. <laughs> I'm not a rabbit. <laughs> I'm not like a rabbit hopping all over the place. You know, uh, conferences are not in some ways, like as big as they used to be back in the early 2000s. But I would meet like conference junkies and they would go from one conference to another and one speaker and just all, all these different speakers. And they had all this stuff floating around in their head. Yet they're not manifesting anything in their own life. You know, I have had people tell me in the county where they've said things like, you know, you know, Stephen, we've heard. So many voices of ministry say, we're going to do this and we're going to do that and all this other stuff. And they say, you're one of the very few that actually say something and then you actually do it. <laughs> Where we see you've checked it off and you actually did it. Well, I said, you know, that's what we're supposed to do. If we say it, we should follow through with it until we get it accomplished. Praise the Lord. So stop watching what everyone else is doing and do what God has called you to do, irrespective of what your field might be. Praise God. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. The Apostle Paul said, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out. Your own. You, you can't work out somebody else's. Even if that's what God told them to do. And maybe you have a similar thing that you're tracking. It's still going to come out different for you. Why? Because you, you have your own unique assignment. And that's the way it is with me. I have to pray. And I have to do what God has told me to do. And even if it were not popular. Even if I'm the only one over in a corner doing it, I'm going to keep on doing it because God told me to do it. And of course, because God's in it, yes, it, it is reaching out and it is affecting many, many people around the world. Praise God. But I, that, I've got to pray that out and I've got to do what God told me to do. And it's the same, my friends, also with you. Praise God. Now, number two. Number two, to uh, keep your focus, you have to hold high the value and uniqueness of your calling. And we see this in the book of Romans. Let's journey over there just for a moment. Romans chapter 11, and this would be verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, 
I magnify my ministry. Now, this is very, very interesting. The word magnify in the Greek means to render or esteem glorious. So Paul's saying, I esteem my ministry as being a glorious ministry. It means to value and hold in high regard. But I can only imagine the way people were back then, because there are many people that are like this today. And people, I'm sure, would tell Paul, Paul! Did you hear the sermon that James, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, just preached? They just uploaded it on YouTube. You've got to go watch it. I tell you what, it is, it's really, really good. But Paul said, I magnify my ministry. And uh, God bless James and Paul. You know Paul's not a jealous, insecure person. More power to him. I pr I'm sure it was a great message, but I'm so busy writing new letters or, or uh, new epistles, new books to the New Testament. I I've got a lot going on over here. Oh, but no, no, no. You, no, you don't, Paul. You should really listen to Peter. Matter of fact, you need to follow him on Instagram and subscribe and like him on YouTube. I tell you what, Peter's ha it's happening with Peter. Is it really? It seems to me that when Paul uh, came to one of the church meetings, that Peter was so off base that even his hypocrisy, his hypocrisy of what he was doing even influenced Barnabas and Paul, the one who wasn't as popular as the great apostles. Ooh, the great apostles, ooh, they're so great. Just do it right with all the others. No, no. Some of the most anointed speakers and preachers are not even they're not even popular. Many people would not even know them. But, but Paul had to literally rebuke Peter at a face-to-face -face confrontation in front of everybody. He didn't even do it in private. He did it in public and said, Peter, you're wrong. You're wrong the way you're acting. You're acting like a hypocrite in this area. And what you're doing is influencing others and causing them to get into sin also. Woo! So Paul knew the vital uh, weight of his ministry and the impact that it was having in the kingdom, and he was not going to act like it wasn't. Now, Paul is not saying, I magnify myself, and I demand all of you get down and kiss the ring. Kiss it now. Whoosh. Kiss it again. <laughs> no, no, no. But he is, he's not magnifying his his own personal self, he is magnifying the vital work that God has given him to do, and he's bringing a ton of Gentiles into the kingdom. God bless Peter. Peter, with your apostolic ministry to the Jews, more power to you. James, you're doing a great job. The church in Jerusalem is growing. We're hearing good stuff. But you look, look, you've got your own thing. You don't have time to be running around. And uh, I mean, there's a place for conferences to learn. There's a place to go sometimes just to see and get exposure to greater things. But that's all because you have your contribution to make. And nobody, hear me, nobody can do it the way you do it. Nobody can say it, express it, verbalize it, or put it together, or do it the way you can do it. Mm. Listen to me if you're called to, to the ministry. If there is a true ministry calling on your life, you'll never really find success until you get into the ministry. You can do good. You know, you work your way through. You do good. Okay. But it's never going to work for you the way it's supposed to until you're in to that calling. Mm -mm. Praise God. You got to keep moving. You got to stay focused. Mm -mm. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. So you magnify your ministry. If you own a restaurant, you magnify your restaurant. This it's the best Hispanic food you've ever had. I tell you what, if we would put a blindfold on you and you were eating this food, you'd think you were down in Acapulco, Mexico. You're going to know this is the best Mexican food you've ever had. You do commercials and you put them on TV. Come and taste the best Mexican food you've ever had. You will not leave hungry. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, Pastor Steve, I'm very shy. It's not a bit about being shy. This is just about you know that God's called you to do something. You can cook and you're going to let it be known, praise God. And you're going to serve them some good food too when they come. You magnify your artwork. Praise God. 
Mm, praise the Lord. You keep on painting. Why? Because you know it's good. Some of the greatest artists that the world has ever known, they were not truly famous until after they were dead. But you know what? They knew when they were alive that their paintings were extraordinary. They knew it. And it took, it took the world a while to catch on. But you know what? Those, many of those paintings today are worth millions upon millions of dollars. But they kept on painting. Why? They knew and they kept on magnifying their artwork. If you've written a book, you magnify your book. There's one preacher. He's, he's, very, um, he's very good at this. And he'll, this is what he'll say. He'll say, now this book, <clears throat> outside of the Bible, this is the greatest book ever written outside of the Bible. Now, now like, a, like a few weeks later when they're on a different product offer, he's got a different book. Now this book here I'm holding in my hand is today's special. And outside of the Bible, I believe this is the greatest book written. And people are like, oh, I better, I better get that book. <laughs> What's he doing? He's magnifying his ministry. That, and that's totally fine. It's, it's kind of funny in some ways. <laughs> Glory to God. But you find your way to express that you're very excited about what God has called you to do. Even if that's the raise, the most wonderful heirloom tomatoes, you have your own online website and you say, I, you post on your website. I'll tell you what, if you've ever eaten one of these tomatoes, your life will never be the same. Ooh, I've got to have them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Praise God. If you have a music album that you created, you've got your nine or ten songs on there. Boy, you put everything into it, and you magnify that album and push it, push it, push it. Praise the Lord. And don't let anybody put any half-baked effort into it. If you see that happening, say, come on, we got to give it the best because this is for Jesus. Or this is the songs that God has given me to sing. They will bring healing to people. It will bring joy to people. Let's do it to a high standard. One time Kenneth Copeland was recording a gospel album and uh, some of the musicians that were playing on the album, they were very high level professional, but some of them were not Christians. And so after they did uh, a recording on one of the songs, um, Kenneth Copeland said, you know what, let's redo this song again. Let's, let's just go through the whole thing again. That first recording was good, but we can do it better. And one of the, one of the musicians, a guitar player, he said, oh, we don't need to do it again. He said, that's good enough for gospel. Woo! He said that in the presence of the wrong kind of a man. And Kenneth Copeland said, I wanted to grab his guitar and wrap it around his neck. Why? Because when you know you're doing what God has called you to do, and it means something to you, and you're putting your heart into it, uh, those around you will rise up, or they can head on out. Praise the Lord. Well, we don't think, well, well, there's the door. God bless you as you go. Amen. Because we are into Jesus. We're keeping our eyes on Him, and we're serious about what He has called us to do. And we're going to be the best in these areas. Whatever that area is, you're going to find your niche, and you're going to begin to highlight it, and you will move ahead. So, hold high the value and uniqueness of your calling. Number three, very quickly, make some form of daily progress. And if you're in a place where you're working full-time while you're developing the part-time thing that's going to become the destiny thing, which will be eventually your full-time thing, well, then maybe you can only, maybe you can't do it every day, but you can do it weekly. Something where you can touch it, invest into it, pour into it, and keep moving it forward. There's always, always something that you can do to take it to the next level. And number four, I would say to stay away from broken focus, avoid good things, but yet they are still things that distract you even though they're good. Let me give an example. Uh, this again is Hebrews chapter 12, and this is verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run. Now, we know that we're going to lay aside sin. We, we know that, okay. But we also need to lay aside weights. What would a weight be? 
Well, there could be something that maybe it, uh, that's good where there's nothing wrong with it. It's morally, ethically pure. It's a good thing. But maybe it's a hobby that's good, but it's distracting you. I've seen people get really caught up in some weird hobbies. This one guy, uh, one time, uh, spirit filled, uh, person, he got caught up in buying these like, uh, European looking dolls. He was a guy and he was buying dolls. And I thought, brother, that's kind of a strange thing to collect. Well, I, I like them and, uh, I can maybe re resell them one day. Pastor Stephen, I thought, uh, I don't have time for stuff like that. So he had a doll collection. He was a single guy with a doll collection. <laughs> well, I think he eventually got, well, I you know he eventually got married and I think he had to liquidate his doll collection. Uh, you know, it's not like there's really a market out there for people that are wanting to buy those secondhand, but you know, people can get pulled into some uh, stuff. Nothing wrong with it. It's not bad, but what it can become a weight. Now you got to check. Now you got to check, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to sell it on eBay. Now you're checking eBay all the time. Now you got to post and now you got to ship it all out. And now you're all tangled up in this and what a mess. No, stay focused like a soldier. Second Timothy chapter two. Let's close with this. Second Timothy chapter two, verse, verse three, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So this is Paul talking to his spiritual son, Timothy, who's a minister. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Can you imagine a soldier out on the battlefield? Bullets are flying. He's got his gun. He's in the fight of his life. But yet, he's, he's wanting to check to see about that stock he invested in. And he's taking a phone with him on the battlefield. And he's trying to get online on the phone and log into the stock account Oh, how's that stock doing? Boom, get shot. No, you don't do stuff like that. You're not allowed a phone, and uh, you should not allow distractions either. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Okay, so if you're not a soldier, maybe you're called to be a stockbroker. Maybe you're called to be a, you know, a trader, you know, whether it's a Forex or whatever it might be. That, that's all fine. But if you're in the soldier uh, world, that is a world of extreme focus. And in many ways, that's the way the ministry is. You've probably noticed that when you go to my website or you go to any of our social media platforms, I'm not offering cars for sale. I don't have a protein powder for sale. I don't have a mega vitamin that you can take that will restore eternal youth to you. Three cans or three bottles, special discount if you support the ministry, uh, $33 with monthly payment. We, we can say, no, 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 I don't do all of that stuff. No, I'm a preacher. Praise God. And God supplies, and, I, and I'm blessed and I'm doing well. But if you really want to get to the top, Let's say you're a salesman, you want to get to the top, then you're a salesman. Don't act like you're a plumber. Don't act like you're an IT specialist. You get in your thing. Don't try to do all kinds of stuff. Mm -mm. Get in your thing just like a soldier. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Pastor Stephen, I want focus. I want to get to the top. You must disentangle yourself from goofy silly stuff that would hold you back. My wife and I have the ability to go quickly. If we need to go, we stay here, we work here. But if I get a call, uh, uh, pastor Steven, I need you in this state. Can you meet me there? I want you to minister. Yeah, I, I can do that. I can make that happen. I need, I need 24 hours so I can, you know, plan that. But yeah, I, I can make that happen. Sometimes I could even do it that day if, if, if it's needed, but we're not all tangled up in all kinds of stuff where I'm like trying to cook 20 different things at the same time. Now, if you're a chef, you can multitask that in the kitchen, but you can't do that and then do something outside of that at the same time and expect you're going to get to the top. You can't. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Well, truth be told, I do know pastors 
that have side hustles. I'm not talking like the Apostle Paul, where you're trying to set a precedent, so you're making tents, you're literally working day and night, because you're working with newborn babies and uh, spiritual babies in a sense, and you're not going to overload them with, with uh, you know, more than they can consume at this point. So he has some side things that he can do, making tents. But I do know pastors who are called into the full-time ministry, and God would bless them there, but they, they, oh, they love tinkering over here with side things, selling this, selling that, and everyone, listen to me carefully, every preacher I've ever met that plays that game, where they're trying to be the you know, the powerful minister, but yet they've got all kinds of wheeling and dealing going on on the side. I've watched the anointing go down on them, every single one of them. It, it is, it's an anointing killer. Now you can go out there and smile, and you can talk, and you can do all of that, but that will not substitute for the anointing. You can still say the right thing, and many of them have been in the ministry for decades, so they can, they know how to like, you know, how can I say, work a crowd. But if you want to flow in the anointing, you cannot be hopping around doing all of this, uh, s selling everything from this and that and the other, and then jump into the pulpit unprepared and think God doesn't see that or think that's not going to affect your ministry. You better believe it does. And everybody that's done that, I've seen the anointing decrease dramatically on their life. Even if they can still stand in the pulpit and smile, they don't have the same level of miracles. The sermons don't have the same edge or the bite. They end up wanting to just preach messages where they play it safe. And uh, now they're, they're just you kind of like comfy and they're cruising. They've lost their focus. It's actually a dangerous place to be. Things can slip in. You're not full of the word. You're not ready or equipped to deal with it. But my friends, Let's have that soldier's mentality. Be a master at what God has called you to. It takes a lot of focus. Mm -mm. Where you diligently have to say no to all kinds of other stuff. All kinds of other stuff. Praise God. Lift your hands. I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray that the word of the soldier not getting entangled will help your people to get the realignment that some need to get their eyes back on Jesus and back on what he told them to do and who he told them they can be. Mm -mm. Father, to, as of today, let them give it what it takes. Let them give it their all. And I thank you that they'll see a very quick shift forward, just like shifting gears. It'll go so quick for them. Now we thank you. Let this be a breakthrough moment for them. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And amen. Woo, the Holy Spirit's really moving. He's really working. If you're watching today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, today is your day of salvation. It's time for you to pray, get your life right with God. I want to pray with you in just a moment. If you're watching and you used to serve the Lord, but you got terribly distracted, and now you even would find yourself in the enemy's camp, outside, far from God, it's time for you to come back and get restored back to God. I want to pray with you also. So together, whether this is your first time or you want to come back to the Lord, let's pray right now. Just say this. Say, Lord Jesus, I call upon your great name right now. Lord Jesus, please forgive me of all of my sins. I repent and I turn from them. Wash me with your precious blood. Write my name in your book of life. And Jesus, step into my life today and lead me and guide me from this day forward. And I keep my focus. I keep my eyes on you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for restoring me. In your name I pray. Amen. And amen. Praise God. Well, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Let's take Holy Communion today. Grab yourself some grape juice. Grab some 
unleavened bread, grab a little cracker, grab what you've got, and let's pray over it. Father, we thank you for the bread and the juice. Through this prayer, we set it apart as being holy. And we thank you that this is the body and the blood of Jesus, veiled in the form of bread and grape juice. Father, as we receive the Lord's flesh, we thank you that we're going to walk in wisdom. We're not going to play with the world like Demas did. And then he had a meltdown. We're going to walk with you and become so fortified like steel. Oh God. Hallelujah. Strong in faith, growing closer to you and stronger in you every day and pulling many up along with us. Father, we thank you for the Lord's body. We receive his strength now as we now consume and eat his flesh. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together of the heavenly manna, the heavenly meal. Father, we thank you that the magnetic pull of the world is being broken off of those who have been captured by the allurements and the enticements of the enemy. We thank you, Father, that our steps are ordered of the Lord and that our walk is a walk with you in the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. We proclaim his death until he comes because it's through his death that the penalty of sin has been paid for, for those that put their faith and trust in him, and that full provision has been made for us to live above everything that the world would present. We are above it, and everything that is not of you is beneath our feet. Oh God, we give you praise. We thank you that we have no envy towards the wicked. Even the wicked that would have great wealth, they're just poor people who have money. They're spiritually poor people who happen to have money. Father, we thank you that we fix our eyes on Jesus as we now receive his precious blood together. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's receive. Well, praise the Lord. Movement of the Spirit. Movement of the Spirit, praise God. A very refined life, a very purposeful life in Christ. Glory to God. Glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. My friends, as we're getting close to March 31st, Resurrection Sunday, allow the Holy Spirit to help you prepare your seed. And I'm praying and believing that God will give you the seed to sow. And this will be a breakthrough moment for you. This is a breakthrough season for you. God's hand is heavy on your life, and he is with you. Heavenly Father, bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. I'll see you back again real soon. Have a great week. Bye-bye.